the greatest reason why we have such a proliferation of Islamophobia in the U.S. today is the constant bombardment of the knowledge of the terrible attacks perpetrated by renegade groups such as Al-Qaeda and ISIS. It's very easy to regard Islam as a civilization that um, is inherently barbarous or anti-modern. Yet, if you take a look back at history, that kind of narrative falls apart. So, at least in the West, the fall of the Roman Empire is considered um, a dark age in Western science because a great deal of intellectual learning kind of collapsed. And many say that with the fall of Rome, the torch of Western civilization was snuffed out, at least for the time being. But that statement is inaccurate because by the 800s to the 1200s, there was a golden age that carried the torch of Western civilization. And that's the Islamic golden age, something we don't really talk about a lot. This was the golden age of learning, philosophy, knowledge, and science throughout North Africa, Persia, and the Levant, which was fueled by the discovery of ancient Greek philosophy. So the golden age of Islam saw birth to new advancements, and I can just list a few of them off because they probably sound familiar. Three-course meals, the very first university, <coughs> surgical tools, torpedoes, the foundations for chemistry and trigonometry, the camera obscura, the scientific method, and perhaps even the first manned flight were all developed or experimented during this era. But I'm going to talk about a couple of examples just to show you that I'm not making this up. <laughs> so, one of the most important philosophers during the uh, produced by Islamic civilization, his name is Ibn Khaldun, who, was, who analyzed his geography and sociology. So, his geography is the study of how we study history, and one of his most famous theories is of uh, this theory that civilization is inherently secular. For example, civilization starts with nomadic barbarians, conquer a settled village or town, then they slowly civilize and they grow more, uh, they, they lose their nomadic ways, they develop civilization, they reach a cultural apex, and then begin to fall, and another barbarian soon takes their place. And these are the kind of periods of history that we still apply when we look at all sorts of civilizations. Another important scientist, his name is Umar Khayyam, who is a Persian, an important mathematician, who set the foundations for modern mathematics. Now, you probably know what algebra is, but if you ever really thought to me, like, what does the word algebra mean? It's algebra. It comes from an Arabic word. Because algebra was first developed by the Arabs. So, that's a very important tool in modern mathematics, but it was still never directly connected to geometry, which was what the Chinese and Greek scientists used. But Omar Khayyam developed a method which could solve cubic equations by inserting a hyperbola into a circle. This was a big deal because it connected geog uh, not geography, a geometry and algebra into one kind of mathematical system. So another man, his name is Ibn Haytham, and he is uh, he's very popular in the West, at least during the time period. He was known as the physicist or the second Ptolemy in European legend. And that's because he had quite a lot of ideas. But I'll talk about a couple of them. For example, he, um, he is credited as the father of the scientific method in that he, he proposed that we test testable theories or hypotheses through experimentation, which is the scientific method. He also wrote a very important book on optics dealing with perpendicular rays and whatnot, but I will get into that. <laughs> and the last person I'll talk about today, his name is Ibn Sina, or Abyssina in the West. And he was born in Bukhara. Now, Ibn Sina is very important because he published a book called The Canon of Medicine. This was a medical encyclopedia published in the thousands, and it was used in the 1650s in Europe because it was so fundamental in the knowledge that, that he collected in the book that they still use the surgical processes until late into the 1600s. But all that's great, but these are just a bunch of people. So what does that, what does that say for the whole civilization? Well, the Islamic Golden Age was entirely endorsed by the Caliphate, which was the government that ran the old Islamic empires. Uh, one of the very first caliphs, Harun al-Rashid, built the House of Wisdom in Baghdad. Now, the House of Wisdom was basically a building where, where he organized all of the old Greek or Indian texts he found, had them translated to Arabic, and invited the best scholars, best intellectuals in the whole land to analyze and build upon. This is a place where you could meet a scholar from Spain, Mali, uh, Bukhara, or even India, all in the same room, which is pretty impressive for the 800s. So this wealth of knowledge is where we get the Islamic Golden Age. But it's 
hard to generalize about the Golden Age. It just lasted five centuries, and so many innovations were made that are key to modern European civilization. Since by the time the Renaissance happened, they just, they just took off from when the Muslims left off. However, there are a couple things we can say about the Islamic Golden Age, in that its pioneers were what we call polymaths, or people like Leonardo da Vinci, who did many different things. I talked about how Avicenna published his Canada Medicine, but he didn't just cover medicine, he covered philosophy and geology. So each of these individuals pursued what interested them purely out of scientific curiosity. Another big trend among these polymaths is that while they studied science, they were also theologians. And it might be a little strange for some of you to imagine why would world class scientists also study religion, but it's important to understand that religion is just like science, another way that we can study and examine the world around us. So, I mean, Isaac Newton himself was a theologian first, mathematician second. So it's no real surprise there. So each of these polymaths each had their own school of thought or theories as to divinity or the Quran. Um, so one of the biggest debates that rocked, of course, the um, Golden Age of Islam, which goes to show the nuance in philosophical development, is the debate between the two uh, schools of thought, the Mutazalites and the Ashuris. So the Mutazalites believed that all inherent truths of the universe, like what's good, what's evil, is the Quran created, is it not? can be derived entirely through rational thoughts. They, they weren't heretics, they were still Muslims, but they believed that rationality and logic were supreme. Of course, they, not everyone believed this. They were the Ashuris who believed that while logic and reasoning is important, scripture should always trump our own mortal tools, and human truths are beyond understanding. And there are thousands and thousands of pages of literature you could read about how, how they debated all of these kind of philosophies both religiously, but also in the sciences. So, this is all great, no, right? But what's the, what's the point I'm trying to make here? In essence, um, it's easy to look today and see the Middle East as backwards or, or uh, barbarous, but it has a tradition of rationality, of science, of thought, of accepting, because many of the people involved in these debates had radically different viewpoints from the central government. Some were atheists, some were Jews and Christians. Uh, if the caliph was ushery, he wouldn't go around murdering all the Mutazalites. And in many ways, it's kind of sad that today the Muslim world doesn't have this kind of philosophy, but it still exists. Just recently, the Nobel Prize winner for chemistry, uh, a doctor named Dr. Aziz Sanjar, shared with two others in chemistry. He is a Muslim, a Turkish American. And even today, Muslims are still producing scientists doctors, computer programmers, and serving the military, they're still productive in society today. So my point is that it's very easy to point Muslims, to paint Muslims as like barbers, especially by what's happening in the Middle East right now. But there's still a tradition of science that many people haven't forgotten. And that's how I think we should fight Islamophobia today.